Uh, I'm here with Albert Whiteside III, who was a captain in the Army, uh, came in during the just pre-Vietnam era and was, was actually stationed for a period in Vietnam. Right, I appreciate right. it. I've been talking to a bunch of veterans over the course of the day, a Marine, Navy, so I'm an Army guy, so go Army, beat Navy. Uh, it's <laughs> good to have good. a, a fellow right. Army guy with me All today. Right. So uh, tell me a little bit about how you got into, into the service. I understand you're part of some pretty almost military royalty and that your dad was an original Tuskegee Airman. So talk about that a little bit. And was it an obligation for you to go into the, into the military given what your dad had done? So talk a, lot, a little bit about that, Al. Um, my dad was in the STRAC flying, I think it was the B-36s. And I was a kid, you know, looking at dad and all that good stuff. And it was just, you know, just to think that your dad was a pilot but I used, you know, so many kids, and you just think everybody's dad is a pilot. But uh, as it turned out, you know, I followed in that footstep. And then when I went to college, I um, got involved in the ROTC program. Right. And this was in 1962, 63. That was the beginning of the Vietnam War. And one thing about the war, if you're gonna go, and I knew I would be going either drafted or going as a volunteer, when I say volunteer after college, I said the best way to go would be over as a second lieutenant. That's right. Or first lieutenant or captain as the case may be. So I went to the ROTC program, got into the flight program. I got into the Army in 1966 when I graduated from college. I was 20 years old at that time. And then I, back then, making captain was pretty much a, you know, just a time thing. So I made captain when I was in flight school. When I went to Vietnam, I was the captain flying airplane, flying small twin engine, uh, a military aircraft. And when did you shift into, into becoming a pilot? When I left the Army, then I went to DuPont, but then after DuPont, I ended up going with two companies, well, three companies. Started off with Southern Airways. I walked into class, and they furloughed the entire class in <laughs> September the 30th, 1971. That was just as I was leaving the military. Okay. Well, since I didn't have that job, I was able to parlay a job to go and work with DuPont and I worked with them for a while. Then I ended up going with Eastern Airlines and we all know what happened to Eastern. Sure. So the next thing after that was I came with uh, Federal Express and I retired from Federal uh, 12 years ago. Well, that's amazing that you, you sort of, you parlayed all that experience as a pilot in the Army with the heritage from your dad and then you became a pilot with uh, with multiple companies. That's a that's a pretty cool story, Al. That's a yeah, pretty it, cool story. It just, just worked out. I, I take no credit for it, but uh, I give all the praise to the man upstairs. He, he guided me, and uh, with that idea in mind, it worked out great. Um, do you have any particular friendships or moments that stand out, uh, you know, in your, in your time while you were in the military or in Vietnam that have been really formative? Well, I have some things that stand out, but when you add the, as the last aspect of formative, I'll leave those things that stand out behind me. Uh, in fact, a lot of times I really don't even like to talk about Vietnam too much because of the impact that it has on me when I think about how it was at that time. Uh, it, it was pretty difficult from the standpoint of being there for a year. I but I, I still make a comparison of Vietnam. When I went to Vietnam in March of 69, I had orders that told me on March of 70, I was gonna be leaving Vietnam. Now, there was no guarantee that I was gonna live that year, but I knew I was gonna leave and it was gonna be over with. The situation that we have in this world today, just to make a comparison, is I don't know anyone that knows when what we're dealing with now is going to be over. Right, right. Yeah, think about it. Um, we've had our children out in harm's way uh, since 2001, 19 consecutive years of armed conflict. Right. And we gotta, we got to remind ourselves of that. Trying to bridge the understanding gap with civilians and the mil and folks that have served in the military, where there's where there's a big gap, right. there's, there's risk. How how have you how, how have you experienced that, and what what can we do better? From the standpoint of how can you bridge that to so people will understand it, I don't have an answer. Yeah. Because I, I find even in some close family members, when they think of some of the holidays associated with the military. They think of it as a holiday, not as a, something to give appreciation to the veteran who went to war and exposed his life 
to a situation where it could be taken. Right. You know, I was blessed and I had a little shrapnel, but I didn't take my Purple Heart, I just blew it off. But the point I'm saying is, I was able to go over, come back, and basically one, one piece. There are so many didn't come back, and then there are so many that came back, but not in one piece. So my last question for you, Al, is that now that you've, um, you know, I, I, I like to say that um, I changed uniforms, but I continue to serve. Um, you took off the uniform, and we're still serving, serving our, our communities, our, our families. Uh, how, how has that kind of manifested itself with you at, once you took off the captain's uniform and, and became a pilot and, a, and all the other things along with that? There are so many people in today's world, economically, don't have an understanding of what the money that they make needs to do as far as farther on down the road. Uh, my brother and I, 20 years ago, came together and we put together a, a program where we we now, my brother has since passed away, my late uh, uh, Gerald. But we put a program together where we show people how you can be effective on Wall Street and not have to have a PhD in financial literacy from Harvard. Uh, Al, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed our conversation. Um, you're, you're welcome back here. We'd love to host you here for a Falcons or United match. So. Appreciate your service. I know it sounds kind of almost, um, almost trite, but it, it's meaningful. It means something to say thank you for what you've done for our country um, in, in your service. So th thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank right. you. I appreciate it.